let's um, have a look. Just one question about uh, the things we introduced uh, last day. A question of notation. Hmm? I told you that the, a joint operator is defined that way. Hmm? If we want to put the operator in the left-hand side of the scalar product, we have to add the adjoint. Yeah, that's a way to define the adjoint. Um, when the bra and kets are used as different entities, as vectors of different spaces, the dual space and the normal vector Hilbert space, it is often used that kind of notation, which in fact, in fact is equivalent to this. Hmm? So, in a certain way, it's the same story. We can put the operator outside the bra, eh, to, to the, to the right-hand side, by adding an adjoint, or if we have an adjoint, by taking out the adjoint. Eh? So, these two notations are equivalent. In general, I prefer the first one, because I prefer not to bother with bra as different entities to get, but you can find both of them in, in the books. And also, the, the, normally in most books, the scalar product, when we have an operator acting on some vector and then multiplied by another vector, uh, normally there are two vertical bars at both sides of the operator and I normally use this notation which in fact is, is the same. Yeah? That means operator A acting on some vector and the result is another vector. For me this is more coherent with the notion of the scalar product yeah? But this is perfectly equivalent and is the most frequently used in most of the books. Okay? Well, let's go on. Oh, let me see if I can. Oh, and now, now the problem is that I don't know. I don't know how to. Let me see. De <laughs> Ahora no sé cómo va esto. A ver. Um, vaya. Ya dice. Un moment. Uh, little problem. I cannot. Well, I have to. Ah, okay. By clicking, it seems to work. Okay, let's clear the screen. Okay. Well, <clears throat> uh, let's have a look to the exercises. Hmm? Since the, to write with this system is not very easy, I have done the exercises by hand and I will discuss it here. I have included them, the solutions, in the presentation. So, let's have a look. Well, quality is not perfect, but I think you can read it. First point, we want to check, to prove, that if we take two times the adjoint, we obtain the original operator. And this is the definition of a joint. So, let's take the operator. Uh, if we change the operator from the, from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, we have to take out the adjoint. And this is what I have applied here. I take out the adjoint, and then here I have only one adjoint uh, symbol. Hmm. And again, here I can put it on the left hand side 
and then we can obtain this result. We can finally obtain that this operator is the same as this operator. Mm? But this is, it is really, it is uh, easily checked that this can be done because if we take here adjoints at both sides, to take the adjoint is equivalent as changing the order of the two factors in a complex scalar product. And so this equation is equivalent to this other equation. And in this equation, we see that to take an operator from the right-hand side, to take the adjoint from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, we have to take out the adjoint symbol. And so that justify the last step of this demonstration. In fact, what we have demonstrated is that this is the same as this when put into this scalar product. But let's verify that if two operators A and B satisfy this equation, in our case, we have A and A adjoint adjoint. But in general, for any two operators, if they satisfy this or this, which is equivalent eh, by taking the conjugate, for any couple of vectors of the Hilbert space, then we are going to see that the operators are the same. One way to, to verify it is to choose an orthonormal basis set, any orthonormal basis set of the Hilbert space. And then put here um, an element of this basis set. If the operators fulfill this equation, then we can write this equality. Okay? And uh, on, the, on the other side, any operator can be put as a linear combination of the elements of the basis set. But the coefficients of the linear combination, if the basis set is orthonormal, we have seen in a previous slide that these coefficients are the scalar products of the vector we are expanding times the basis set element on the left-hand side. And so these are the coefficients. And so if this holds for any coefficient, we can assure that this vector is equal to this vector for any psi in the Hilbert space. And that means that the two operators are equal. Two operators are equal when they give the same result when acting on a given vector of the Hilbert space. And that is what we have verified here by expanding the vector in a given basis set. Okay? So from now on, we know that this is equivalent to say that A equal B. Okay? Well, if you have any question, uh, please interrupt me. Yeah. Let me see. No. I have to recover the mouse. Um, yeah, to clear the screen. <coughs> Maya. Ah. Let's go to the second point of the exercise. It was to verify that the adjoint of the product of two operators is the product of the adjoints, but in the written in the reverse order. Hmm? Well, <coughs> Uh, well, this is rather simple. For instance, to I, I want I um, 
I will go to to use the previous result. Eh? So if this is equal to this for any couple psi psi prime of elements of the Hilbert space, then we have demonstrated that the operators are equal. Eh? And this is very straightforward. Eh? In order to put here in the other side, I have to take out the adjoint symbol. Then to put A in the first side, I have to add the adjoint symbol. And again, to put B on the left side, just uh, you have to take care about the order of the operators. Yeah? We have this vector and then the operator must be before the vector that was on the left hand side. So we finally have B and A, B, B dagger, A dagger applied to psi. This symbol is called dagger. Why? And um, a similar relationship can be applied when taking the inverse of an operator. I think this one you have. So some of, of those relationships have appeared in the first part of the course. But uh, I want to show you how to verify them without using specific representation of the or representations of the operators or as um, uh, matrices or as uh, derivatives or multiplicative operators and so on. Eh? By using only the properties, the definition of an operator and the properties of the commutators and so on, everything can be demonstrated also. Hmm? Well, this is uh, very simple. Eh? The definition of the inverse of A is an operator that, that when multiplied with A by the left of the right hand side is the unity operator. Hmm? Unity operator sometimes is also called by the let uh, represented by letter A. Yeah, but I think one with the hat <laughs> is very clear. Well, um, <clears throat> well, then what I will verify is that this operator is the inverse of this, mm, which is in fact the result I am looking for. Mm. So I multiply this operator by this operator in this order. Then here, a minus 1 times A is the identity. Eh? B minus 1 times B, again, is the identity. So we obtain the identity. Mm? And if we do it in the reverse order, we have exactly the same. Eh? Two identities multiplied give again the identity. Eh? It's a trivial result. Mm? Well, this result is very trivial. And I think you have already checked it in the first part. This also is very trivial. If I have in one side of a commutator a linear combination of two operators, then I expand the sum. Yeah? This means this yeah? time the... Well, I have already multiplied this by first term and second term, and I obtain these two terms. Eh? And the same for the reverse product. Eh? If I have, if I put this first and this in the second place, then I obtain this result. And then uh, this with this is this, and this with this is this. Okay. Well, this is a very useful relationship. Yeah? And also, it's very straightforward to, to verify. Yeah? In practice, when we have a product of two elements in either side of a commutator, then we can expand it, expand it as two terms. In one of them, I take B 
on the left hand side. In the other term, I take C on the right hand side. So it's very easy to remember the relationship, to recall it. Mm -hmm. And to demonstrate it, I expand this, which is this. I expand this, which is this. These two terms vanishes, and then I obtain the, the result I was looking for. Yeah? Then I have that uh, A times BC minus BC times A. This is nothing but the commutator A, uh, comma, BC. Okay? Well, let me go on. Right. Okay, wonderful. Oh, when things work, it's wonderful. <laughs> okay, and um, let's apply those ideas to verify the commutation relationships of the angular momentum components. Hmm? Uh, commutator of Lx and Ly. We take the definition, the, the expression of the operators Lx and Ly. Yeah, we show them in a previous slide in the in last class. This is Lx and this is Ly. Then. I multiply, uh, I use uh, the, what we have just seen when we have a linear combination in either side of the commutator. In fact, uh, if we have a linear combination of operators, I can, I can develop it as a linear combination of commutators. That means the operation of commutativity is distributive as the ordinary product of operators. So this can be separated in four products. For instance, this commutator with this. The first with the second. There is a minus sign, so I put the minus sign, etc., etc. I can develop the commutator in four commutators. First term with first term, first with second, second with first, second with second. Let's consider the first one. Here, I can use what we have just proved, that we can take the first operator on the left-hand side and the second on the right-hand side and write this commutator as the sum of these two terms. Okay? And again, here, we have also a product of two operators, so let's take the first one. Well, strictly, uh, it should be, yeah, okay, here, and the right operator outside on the right-hand side. This gives this and this. Hmm? And the same here. The y coordinate can go outside and we up no sorry <laughs> here. The z coordinate can go outside and we have this term and the px coordinate can go outside and we have this term. And we have developed it in four terms. And then if we look at the second postulate that, that assigns to X and P operators that fulfill some commutation relationships, we see that this commutator is zero because any pair of P operators commute. This commutator is also zero. No, 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 this one not. <laughs> Uh, the commutator Z, P, Z, is I, H bar. So, since these are 
written in the reverse order, we have to add a minus sign eh, but the, to the commutator that appears in the postulate. Okay? Here, again, we have a commutator which is zero because we have P and a coordinate with different index. Px commutator with y, or y commutator with px. And here, we have two coordinates, and the commutator was zero. So, the only term that, that is non-vanishing is minus i h bar times y px y px well the same can be done with the four terms we have here okay? let's look at the second we do not need to write it in detail in detail because the idea is very simple we have to take out a product um, the the factors in order to finally reach commutators like this or like this with only one operator in each side and then apply the postulate. For instance, when we take out, uh, well, at the end, yeah, um, at the end we will have a commutator with this and this. Yeah, for instance, here, this is this commutator. If you, if you look at the, the case we have solved in detail, we finally have a commutator of this with this, a commutator of y with px, a commutator of pz with z, and a commutator of pz with px. Yeah? This one, this one, this one, and this one. They are multiplied by operators on the right or on the left. But let, let's first see which are these commutators, because most of them are going to be zero. For instance, the commutator of P, Z, and X is zero because they are different, they correspond to different coordinates. The commutator of Px or Pz and Pz is zero because they are the same operator. The commutator of Y with X is zero and the commutator of Y with Pz is also zero. So we can forget of this term. Here, same thing. The commutator of y, py and z, 0. py, px, 0. z, z, 0. z, px, 0. Hmm? Here, py, x, 0. py, pz, 0. z, x, 0. Z, P, Z, non-zero. This is the only term that is non-zero. It's A, H bar. And so here we have put I, H bar, X. And, and then when we develop this term, when we have the commutator of Z, P, Z, we have uh, had to take, well, let's erase something because, okay, let's go back. When we take PY on the right hand side and X on the left hand side, then we obtain X commutator z p z and on the right hand side p y this is a 
Achbar X PY. Yeah. This. And so finally, we see that we obtain X PY. Well, uh, X PY minus Y PX, which, which is just, as you can check in a previous slide, is just the, def the, the expression of the LZ, the Z component of the angular momentum. Hmm? And so, by using only, in fact, all the quantum mechanics can be developed without relying in any particular rep representation. The only thing we need to know about the operators is how they commute. And this is enough to, to develop, in fact, all the theory. Hmm? Of course, when we, uh, when we study the representations, we will see that these operations can be also checked by multiplying the corresponding matrices. But quite often, it's easier to do it this way. I think it's interesting to know both ways of, of follow these deductions, because sometimes in some papers you can find uh, developments like this. Okay? Well, and the last point is, is very is much simpler. Eh? Yeah. The, uh, you want to sit here? Okay, of course. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, there is plenty of, okay. But finally, uh, the last point was to show that Lx commutes with L square. Hmm? L square in Cartesian coordinates is Lx square plus Ly square plus Lz square. Hmm? And so I can expand this as three terms yeah, with the three squared components. First one clearly is zero. Yeah. An, operator's al an operator always commutes with itself or with any. In fact, as we will see, it, only, it commutes also with any power of itself and even with any function of itself. We will, we will see this uh, later on. Okay? Well, this term, again, I have here square. I have two times the operator Ly. So let's take one term on the left hand side and one term on the right hand side. We obtain this and this. And we have seen in the previous point that this is a HLZ. Hmm? And this is exactly the same. Hmm? And here, again, this square can be expanded into terms, which are this one and this one. And here we have LX, LZ. Um, you know that the, the, the relationships this relationship, for instance, this have, yeah, this, this is one of three relationships that can be obtained by, by making cyclic permutation of the indexes. So if I put here y, z, then here I have to put x, and if I put here Z, X, here we have Y, a sub-index. Yeah? Since here they are in the reverse order, not Z, X, but X, Z, X, Z, uh, the result is with a minus sign and the commutator has to be inverted. Yeah? And so, finally, uh, this term let me see, this term vanishes with this term, and this term vanishes with this term. Yeah? So the result is zero. Yeah? 
you ha we have here L X, L Y, L Z, L Y, L Z, eh? and the same for the other two. Hmm? Okay. Well, so this is an exercise to see how the the definition of the operators of the second postulate can directly be used for to show in general any property of the operators. Hmm? Well, any question? Oh, there is, there is, oh sorry, I didn't realize, let me see, let me try to, okay. Um, a ver, uh, could you repeat why, okay, uh, just at the end, okay, okay, let's go on. Um, ah, pasa aquí. Uh, vale. uh, here, if I make here, <laughs> sometimes I forget that you don't see me. <laughs> and I, I say here <laughs> without pointing, and sorry, sorry about that. I will try not to do it. Here, I have put instead, well, the, the final result is here. I, ha I can permutate x, y, and z cyclically. So, x, y, z, y, z, x, uh, z, x, y. Hmm? Here, I have not LX, LZ. I have, no, <laughs> well, let's write it. Eh? So we can write this. L, uh, Y. Eh? And here, they are written in the reverse order. So I have to add the minus sign. Hmm? Okay. Let me see. <laughs> ah, it's quite. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. And then. Okay. Well, let's go on. And let's erase. <clears throat> well, um, what is the spectrum of an operator? The spectrum is nothing, wait, here, no, I have lost <laughs> the, the window of, no, I have a problem that I won't know if you are adding questions, don't know. Mysterious. <laughs> okay, well, uh, if you have questions, maybe you will, we have to leave them for the end because the window of the question marks has disappeared. <laughs> Mystery. Um, I hope everybody's seen the. No tenemos ningún portátil. Well, I hope you are, you are seen. Okay. What is the spectrum of an operator? The spectrum of an operator is nothing but the set of its eigenvalues. I have put here eigenvalues in a wide sense because these are, this is a true eigenvalue equation, but for the continuous spectrum, when the eigenvalues form a continuous, this is not exactly um, a mathematician would say that this is not an eigenvalue equation because, because this is a variable, for instance, if I write this, x operator applied to some function, value function, uh, you could say, okay, this is not a constant. Eh? But in a sense, in quantum mechanics, we normally use this in the same sense as we use this. That's a way to formally extend the eigenvalue equations to k 
cases in which the eigenvalues are continuous. Eh? Mathematically, there are some subtle points that I will not enter on. Eh? The, we will use the letter sigma for the spectrum, and if the operator has a discrete part and a continuous part, we have two subsets, the discrete spectrum and the continuous spectrum. Well, an eigenvalue, you know, that has, uh, if there are several linearly independent eigenvectors with the same eigenvalue, we say that the eigenvalue is degenerate. Yeah, the degeneracy is nothing but the number of independent vectors with that eigenvalue. Mm -hmm. uh, we sometimes will use a, a first index in the eigenvectors to identify the eigenvalue and a second index, J, to differentiate different eigenvectors with the same eigenvalue. If the degeneracy is DI, then I have DI eigenvectors with the same eigenvalue. Okay? Very useful theorem. In fact, we have already mentioned it in the last class. Any linear combination of the generate eigenvectors of a linear operator is also an eigenvector of that operator with the same eigenvalue. And the reverse is also true. If not all the combined eigenvectors are degenerate, the linear combination is not an eigenvector. Mm, a consequence of this is that, for instance, if we have a, a doubly degenerate eigenvalue, yeah, uh, an eigenvalue with two independent eigenvectors, any linear combination of them is also a li an eigenvector. But all the linear combinations define a plane. Yeah? All the linear combinations of, of two basis vectors form a plane. So, in fact, we can say any element of that plane is an eigenvector. Or even, we have an eigenplane. All the plane is uh, an eigenspace of the operator. So, if we, if we have a non-degenerate eigenvector, we have, in fact, an axis, because an eigenaxis, because we can multiply it by any number, and again, we have an, an eigenvector. If we have a doubly degenerate uh, eigenvalue, in fact, we have uh, an eigenplane. If we have a three degenerate, we have an eigen three dimensional space, etc. Okay? <coughs> <clears throat> well, I have put here a very simple example. Consider a system which has a three-dimensional Hilbert space. For instance, the spin states of a particle with a spin 1 is a three-dimensional Hilbert space. Yeah? It could be an example. Well, let's consider an operator A which has two eigenvalues, A1 and A2. The first one is doubly degenerate, so we have two eigenfunctions, and the other one is non-degenerate, we have only one eigen... Well, I should rather say eigenvectors. I still have not introduced wave functions, eigenvectors. Uh, we can represent, well, uh, these three eigenvectors as basis sets in a three-dimensional Hilbert space, which is uh, one. Of course, the coefficients could be complex. Let's consider that the, co the coefficients are real, and so it's completely equivalent to the uh, physical space. Hmm? Well, in this case, 
The horizontal plane is an eigenplane of the operator with eigenvalue A1. And the vertical axis is an eigenaxis, we could say, eigenaxis with eigenvalue A2. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, of course, for instance, if we go to the hydrogen atom, mm, disregarding, disregarding the spin, you know that the, the generacy of the energy levels, eh, the first energy level has energy minus one half in atomic unities and the generacy one. Eh. The second one has energy minus one over eight, eh, the generacy four, eh, and the, the states 2s, 2px, 2py, 2pz are degenerate. Eh. You already know that the degeneracy, in fact, for any level is n square. Mm -hmm. And so, for the ground state, we have a one-dimensional eigenspace. For the first sighted state, we have a four-dimensional eigenspace, etc., etc., okay? Well, let me try. Okay. Well, I have an exercise here. For each of the following operators, say if the spectrum is discrete, continuous, partially discrete, partially continuous, as well as the degeneration of each value of the spectrum. Um, I don't pretend that you solve the, the eigenvalue equation for all of them. I only pretend that you have a look to some book and you found, you, you, you look at the result and then uh, you can answer those questions. Yeah, but don't only look at the solution in, in any book. In fact, this case, I already commented it in the last class. Yeah. We, I recalled you that for the hydrogen atom, in, if this is the energy of the eigenstates and this is the zero, we have A1, A2, A3, etc. All the eigenvalues which are negative form a discrete set. Our, the numerable, our discrete energy is quantized. These are equivalent expressions. Mm -hmm. But positive values form a continuous that corresponds to collision states in which we have a proton and uh, an electron that are not hold together, and then the positive part of the spectrum is continuous. Any real positive number can be an energy of the system. The system is the same, but uh, these are um, bound states, and this is an unbound state, a ionized atom. Okay? Well, uh, okay, think a little about the rest, yeah, and if, we have, if you have any doubt, we will discuss it next day. Okay, let's go on. <coughs> well, some properties, some theorems that are, some of them very easy to verify, you know that the spectrum of a self adjoint operator is real, any eigenvalue is real. Uh, two eigenvectors of a self adjoint operator with different eigenvalues are orthogonal. This is also very useful. Mm? Uh, quite often, it's uh, rather easy to, 
to, to, to know that some vectors are orthogonal because they correspond to different eigenvalues of some operator. The eigenvectors of a self-adjoint operator form a complete set. Yeah, I have a question here. But in the, in the example, in the previous example of the three-dimensional Hilbert space, the, the eigenvectors of the degenerate, degenerated state were also orthogonal. Yeah, yeah. Let what happened when we have degeneracy? When we have, for instance, as in the previous example, here I have, this is an eigenplane with eigenvalue A1, and this is an eigenaxis with eigenvalue A2. According to the theorem, any vector of the plane must be orthogonal to any vector of the axis, which from the figure is trivial. Eh? But what happens with vectors that are degenerate? The theorem tells us nothing about them. We can take them orthogonal because since this is, this is a two-dimensional space, in a two-dimensional space, we can always find a basis set, which is a couple of vectors which are linearly independent. The basis set in this eigenplane could be, for instance, this and this. A basis set can be non-orthogonal. So we could have chosen two vectors which are not orthogonal. The question is that two independent vectors can always be orthogonalized. We can make a change of basis to obtain two uh, orthogonal eigenvectors. And we will later on see several methods to orthogonalize independent vectors. And so it's rather convenient to choose the basis orthogonal, since that's an option that we can always use. Uh, expressions of the coefficients and of the scalar products are, are much simpler when we use orthogonal basis set, as I put in the previous slide. Hmm? But sometimes in quantum chemistry, you, you, you already know that atomic basis sets are not orthogonal. Elements of dif uh, centered in, in different centers, for instance, are non-orthogonal, at least if they are not very far apart. Hmm? And so we have to take care with this and we will, in general, also refer to what happens when the basis set is non-orthogonal. Okay? Well, um, the eigenvectors are a complete set. If the, operators, if the operator has only discrete spectrum, that means that any element of the Hilbert space can be put as a linear, as a maybe infinite linear combination of those elements, of those eigenvectors. But in the general case in which I have an operator A with some part of the spectrum which is discrete and some part of the spectrum which is continuous, and so for the discrete case, I normally put an index an index y, j, which takes uh, um, integral numbers. Eh? And for the continuous part, I do not need the index because already the value can be used to identify. Eh? As in the x case, I put v4. Eh? But here, again, we can have some degeneracy. Eh? So in this very general case, the basis set can be understood in this way. Any vector of the Hilbert space can be put as a linear combination of the elements of the discrete part of the spectrum. Here we sum over the eigenvalues. And for each eigenvalues, we sum over the vectors corresponding to that eigenvalue. And same thing 
for the continuous part of the spectrum. But since they are continuous, instead of a sum over eigenvalues, I have to put an integral over eigenvalues. Hmm? So this is the most general expansion of a vector of the Hilbert space in the in the basis set of eigenstates, of eigenvectors of any operator. I advance something that will be studied deeply in following classes. Um, these are coefficients identified with numerical indexes. We can put them as a column vector in this column in fact, as we will see, represents the vector if there is only discrete uh, elements in the basis set. But this, I have not put the first index. I have put directly that D depends on the eigenvalue. But when we have a function of a continuous variable, we normally do not write this as a subindex, but with a parenthesis. In fact, these coefficients are functions of A. And this type of functions is what we call wave functions. As we will see, if we use, for instance, the basis set of eigenstates of the position operator, the position operator has a completely continuous spectrum any real value can be a result of measuring a position. And then the expansion in terms of the position eigenstates has not discrete part, only continuous part, and these coefficients are a representation of the state vector in the basis set of eigenstates of the position. Same for the momentum operator. Momentum, linear momentum has also a only continuous, a completely continuous spectrum. But we will see this in detail uh, later on. Huh? But this is an. Just ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I give him some hints <laughs> for the exercise. Well, that's good. You have catch the idea. <laughs> okay, so let's go on. Well, commuting more theorems. Um, I don't bother with the demonstration of the theorems in general because they are in every book, but I only want to recall the main things, the main properties of theorems that we will need. Yeah? This is probably very well known by you. Two operators commute if and only if there exists a, com there exists a complete set of eigenvectors common to both. Yeah? Eigenvectors of both. Yeah? And we can extend it to several observables and in that case, the condition for them to be compatible is that any pair of operators commute. We have to check that all the pairs commute. Well, examples that you perfectly know for the hydrogen atoms, for the hydrogen atom, these four operators commute and uh, uh, we often use a basis set in which we use four quantum numbers that precisely represent the eigenvalues of these four operators. Mm -hmm. Three if we do not consider the spin. Mm -hmm. um, quite often, in, in direct notation, we write the symbol of the cat and we put here only the numbers, yeah, in some books, it's customary to put only the indexes that represent the, eigen, the eigenvalues yeah, and not to put the letter of the wave function. Yeah. Well, 
Um, if two operators do not commute, there cannot be a complete set of common eigenvectors. But it could happen that they have some common operators. Eh? It depends on the case. And um, for instance, the one S, in fact, any S state of a hydrogen atom is an eigenstate of Lx, Ly, Lz with eigenvalue 0. So in any S state, we perfectly know, in fact, we know that the modulus of the angular momentum is 0, and so the three components should be zero, as, could, as can be verified. For instance, if you work in position representation, we can check that these two, these three operators have derivatives with the angular coordinates and the S orbitals are independent on the angular coordinates. So it's a trivial thing to check that these three operators give the result zero when applied to any S uh, state. Yeah. Of course, if some operator applied to some vector, say 1S, gives 0, you always can write this. Yeah. So in this case, it's an eigenstate, it's an eigenvector, and the eigenvalue is 0. OK? <coughs> Well, let's recall some properties of angular momenta. You have, uh, you, all of you know this, but to recall them in a singular slide, hmm, you know that in quantum mechanics, the concept of angular momentum is wider than in classical mechanics. The classical mechanics angular momentum, in fact, correspond in quantum mechanics to the orbital angular momentum. But you know that there exists also a spin angular momentum, which is a, an intrinsic property of the particles. And uh, both can be, can be grouped in a single definition, in a single general definition. I use the letter J, that could be spin or orbital. And in fact, the definition of angular momentum in quantum mechanics is uh, an observable a vector observable with three components that fulfill these commutation relationships. Any observable with Cartesian coordinates fulfilling this is uh, an angular momentum. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, with cyclic, cyclic permutation of the indexes. Mm -hmm. From this, this Relationships, again, are enough to demonstrate that, well, in fact, we have seen it <laughs> in the exercise before, that this can be demonstrated by using only these relationships. Yeah? And, of course, this implies that the J square is compatible with any of the components. So we can choose a complete set of eigenvectors of these two operators, or these two, or these two. Of course, there are, these are three different sets. Eh? We normally choose the, this case, because the expression of JZ is simpler in polar coordinates, and the eigenvalue equation for these two operators has the usual form you already know eh, for J squared and for j, z. This quantum number that represent the eigenvalues of j square, if you start using only these commutation relationships, we found that it can have any integer, positive integer, or half integer. In fact, we should say half odd. Yeah? Uh, value. But probably you already know that in the particular case of the orbital angular momentum, if you use the split
explicit expression of the orbital angular momentum in terms of position and coordinates, uh, uh, position coordinates and momenta, then you obtain that only integer values are allowed for quantum number L. And in the case of a spin, the quantum number can be any one of these series, but only one, because a spin is an intrinsic property of the particles. So depending on the particle, it could be integer or it could be half odd, but we have only one value. For instance, for the electrons, we have... Well, and finally, let's comment on the ladder or shift operators. Uh, when using this basic set, it's quite useful to change. Instead of using, um, say, well, Jx, Jy, Jz, <coughs> The result of applying J set is trivial in this basis set, but the result of applying Jx and Jy is not so simple. And then we normally change this and use instead of this the sum and the difference, which essentially are um, J plus and J minus, which are defined here. Mm -hmm. And the action of this operator is very simple. Eh? J plus change an eigenstate, one of these states, an eigenstate of Jz, to the eigenstate with one unity mm, added to the n value. Eh? And J minus changes to the, to the following value in descending order. Eh? That's why we call it ladder operators or shift operators. Eh? So when, when you have to deal with, you, you have to take, uh, to operate with any of these op operators, sometimes it's easier to put them in terms of j plus minus. Of course, if you sum these two equations, you obtain, for instance, that Jx can be put as J plus plus J minus divided by 2. Yeah? And similar relationship for Jy. Uh, I had a question here, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. This, this means angular momentum. Uh, yeah, in, in the particular case in which, let me, let me erase. <clears throat> this is completely general. This can be applied to orbital angular momenta or to a spin angular momenta. In the case of orbital angular momenta, we use the letter L normally instead of J. Well, it depends. For electrons, we use L, but for nuclei, we use J, <laughs> because in the case of nuclei, we have the rotational angular momentum that is normally represented by letter J. But letter is indifferent. The question is that in this case, you obtain that the quantum number that identifies the eigenvalues of L squared takes only integer values, and then the eigenfunctions are the spherical harmonics. Eh? So the spherical harmonics, in fact, are the eigenvectors of L square when, when you use wave functions in coordinate representation. Eh? When we represent them, eh, it's an explicit representation of these eigenvectors in coordinates. Hmm? So, um, harmonic, uh, spherical harmonics appear in the particular case in which the, or the, um, the angular momentum is of orbital type. Yeah? 
more questions. Well, uh, cuando sea la hora, <laughs> me avisáis. <laughs> Let me continue. Well, I, I am punto. Hmm. Ah, okay, I think it's uh, time to, for a break. We, made, uh, we make a 10 minutes break. And uh, I check if I recover the possibility of looking at the messages. Vamos a ver. ¿Qué está pasando aquí? A ver. Joder, espero que lo hayan estado viendo. Porque aquí... Pero es que no, no veo los mensajes. Ah, bueno, os habrían dicho algo vosotros, ¿no? Vamos a ver. ¿Qué coño pasa aquí? Ay. Mostrar, ah, <coughs> mostrar siempre barra de herramientas tendría que ser esto. Ya, ya, ya. Pero es que aquí, aquí dice mostrar siempre para de herramientas. Y... Ah, vale, vale. Vale, entonces, ¿por qué ahora no me sale? Vale. Sí, sí, sí. Los de al lado, cerrar, pero... No, no ha cambiado nada. Bueno, vamos a ver. Voy a, voy a salir de la aplicación. ¿Desea guardar cambios? No. Pero sí. Es que... Ahora, vale. Vamos a ver. Eh... Vale, ahora, ahora he vuelto a salir. Bueno, creo que... Bueno, veo que no hay ningún mensaje. A ver si ahora consigo parar... Que se estará grabando todo esto. Stop sharing. Vale. Meeting. Vale. Y ahora aquí. Vale, perfecto. Bueno. Mmm, bueno, 
let's wait one minute. My, my students have, most of them disappeared. Uh, oh, now we have a menu bar. Bueno, sí, se ve más o menos. Pues es que esto, esto voy a poner aquí. Ajá, ok. Bueno, any message? Ok. No news, good news. <laughs> you have any question? Well, so let's let's continue. <clears throat> well, uh, as we will see, there is a, a special type of operators that play a very important role in quantum mechanics. These are the projection operators. Uh, well, sorry, this is not the first. Vaya. Oh. One moment. Por qué? Ahora. Proyectos. Ok. <coughs> But let's consider a Hilbert space with two subspaces, H1 and H2. Mm? We say that H is the direct sum of H1 plus H2, and this symbol is used for the direct sum, if every vector of the complete Hilbert space admits a unique decomposition in which the first term is an element of H1 and the second term is an element of H2. Hmm? For instance, the three-dimensional space can be considered as a direct sum of the horizontal plane and the vertical axis, hmm? a two-dimensional subspace plus a one-dimensional subspace. <coughs> well, it can be shown that the direct sum fulfills that the only common vector of the the terms we are adding is the zero vector. In the previous example, the only common vector of the horizontal plane and the vertical axis is the origin. And also, it can be shown that the dimension of the complete space is the sum of the dimensions of the two spaces we are adding. In the example I have given you of the three-dimensional space, this is trivial. Eh? Dimension three, two plus one. In fact, this is an equivalent way of defining the direct sum of subspaces. <coughs> well, definition. <coughs> the projector onto a subspace H1 associated, yeah. the projector associated to some particular decomposition <coughs> is an operator that assigns to each vector of H its component in the subspace H1, yeah. according to the definition we have seen before. Okay? In particular, we often choose the two subspaces orthogonal. Mm -hmm. That means that all the vectors of one of them are orthogonal to all the vectors of the other one. Yeah? For instance, the horizontal plane and the vertical axis in the physical space. Mm -hmm. Then, well, the orthogonal complement yeah, that is designed with this symbol yeah, of some subspace is the set of, of all vectors of H 
orthogonal to every vector of the subspace. Hmm? And uh, it's a trivial matter to verify that any Hilbert space can be written as the sum of any subspace plus its orthogonal, orthogonal complement. Yeah. Again, in the example I have given you of three-dimensional space, of course, the horizontal plane and the vertical axis are orthogonal. Yeah. One is the orthogonal of the other and vice versa. The orthogonal projector onto some subspace is the projector onto that subspace associated to this particular decomposition. Mm. Um, this is, in fact, the, we, we can find projectors for any decomposition like this, even if, it, if these two subspaces are non-orthogonal. But in quantum mechanics, it's, uh, in most quantum mechanics books, it's understood that, we speak, that when we speak of projectors, it implies that we refer to orthogonal projectors. Eh? So from now on, we won't specify the qualifier orthogonal. And when we speak of projectors, we always will refer to orthogonal projectors. That means projectors associated to the, comp to the decomposition of the Hilbert space in two subspaces, as a sum, direct sum of two subspaces which are orthogonal. Okay? <clears throat> okay. Um, well, so let's consider Hilbert space with some subspace H1 and its orthogonal complement. And let's look, let's choose an orthonormal basis in H1 and an orthonormal basis in its complement. Hmm? Mm, since in quantum mechanics the spaces could be infinite dimensional, it could happen that any of those dimensions, or even both of them, are infinite. But things are, this may not any important difference. Well, then I can use this basis set, the complete basis set, to express any state, any vector state, any vector of the Hilbert space. We can put it that way, or explicitly separate the two parts corresponding to H1 and to the complement. Mm. Then, mm. of course, according to the definition of projection operators, this is the projected, and this is the result of applying the projector onto H1, and since we can write the operator as identity applied to the, to, the, to the vector psi. The rest can be put in as 1 minus p applied to psi. So here I have decomposed the vector psi in its component in H1 and its component in a one orthogonal complement. Mm. Well, uh, for orthonormal basis sets, we have already seen that the coefficients can be calculated that way as a scalar products. And then this, the effect of projecting, applying the projector P to Psi, which is this element, can be written that way. Yeah. I have put, instead of CR, I have put this. And so, formally, we can say, okay, let's 
put the ket of the vector outside the sum, and then this is an expression of the operator, eh? an expression of the operator mm, associated to this particular basis set of H1. Eh? In quantum mechanic books, this is the usual way of representing projection operators. Hmm? And so we can write this. Well, again, this can be viewed in two ways. We can say that this is a product of a ket times a bra, or if we want, if we do not want to make the distinction between bras and kets, we can say, okay, this is nothing but a notation that that makes it, makes it easy to, to, to remember how this operator acts. The action of this operator is when I want to see how the operator acts on any state, I write the state at the right-hand side and I take this scalar product. Hmm? There are two ways of viewing this expression. Eh? In fact, the question is that this type, this notation is an operator. Yeah? And the result of this operator is to take the scalar product of the vector upon which it is acting. In particular, if, <clears throat> uh, if I project over the whole Hilbert space, then by using any basis set, I can, well, in fact, this can be considered a projection in which I sum over the complete basis set. And so for any basis set, I can say that this is a way of expression of expressing the identity operator for that particular basis set. And this is, as you already have seen in the first part, this is a resolution of the identity, also called a closure relationship. For any basis set, you can write a resolution of the identity, which is nothing but a sum of projectors for every element of the basis set. So, in fact, this is equivalent in ordinary physical space at saying that if you project a vector along the x-axis, then the y-axis, then the z-axis, you obtain the three components of the vector, and the sum, of course, recovers, leads to the original vector. And so the identity can be put that way, this is the generalization for any Hilbert space. It's important to, to remember that all of this is valid for orthonormal basis sets. If the basis set is non-orthonormal, the resolutions of the identity are more complex. It can be shown, you can take this and apply it to any vector, and you can verify that this is the identity operator when the basis set is non-orthonormal. Here I have the overlap matrix, in fact the inverse of the overlap matrix. So to write a resolution of the identity for non-orthonormal basis set is more complex. Okay? These and many other reasons make us try to choose uh, orthonormal basis set whenever possible. And everything is much simpler. <coughs> well, some properties. A linear combination. I, a linear combination of projectors is onto orthogonal subspaces is a projector if and only if all the coefficients are one. Hmm? For instance, let's consider some operator 
and the eigenvectors corresponding to one particular eigenvalues. I, uh, eigenvalue. If the eigenvalue has degeneracy d, then we have the eigenvectors. Then the projector onto the eigenspace, eigen subspace, is the sum of the projectors onto every single vector, eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue A, yeah, with index A. Okay? <clears throat> um, well, uh, property or theorem states that projector operators are self-adjoint and idempotent, and also but linear, of course, and multiplet, but I will not enter uh, on the definition of bounded. The important thing for me is that they are self-adjoint and they are idempotent. Idempotent is, means that the square of the operator coincides with the operator, which is rather trivial. If we project one time, for instance, in R3, if we apply a projector onto the horizontal plane, we obtain a vector in the horizontal plane. And we, if we project it again, the result is not changed because we are already in the horizontal plane. Eh? This is say, this is P or P square, or <laughs> we can apply the projector as many times as as we like. Well, uh, well, that's the that's the meaning of bulk net, but it's not relevant for our discussion, so we leave it. And uh, just some comments. Eh? When I have, for instance, the, a projector applied to some vector and then scalarly multiplied by the same vector, since this is the same as p square, and since p is um, self-adjoint, we can take one of the p's and put it here, and then the scalar product of p psi, p psi, the scalar product of a vector by itself is the square of the modulus of the vector. So this is the same as this. Hmm? If we put it in terms of components in the particular basis set, hmm, this is the projection, uh, the expression of the projection for a particular basis set. Hmm? We put it in both sides of the scalar product, and then we take out the sums and the coefficients, hmm? Because the coefficient in the first term goes out with a complex conjugate, yeah? second coefficient, and then we obtain this expression, which again, for the particular case of orthonormal basis sets, then this reduce to the Kronecker delta. So this double sum vanishes unless the two indexes coincide, and then we, are, we obtain C um, conjugate times C, which is nothing but the square of the complex number C. Yeah? And so for orthogonal basis set, the modulus of the projection is the sum of the square of the coefficients which is again a result that is trivial if we remember what happens in three-dimensional space. To, to refer to three-dimensional space, I think is very, very useful to see that many of those properties are really simple, are, are easy to remember. For instance, which is the length of this projection, the square of the length? So by, if we take the components along the two axes, the two axes, this is the, say, the psi, psi x, this is the psi y, 
and so the length of this projection squared is by Pythagoras <laughs> Yeah. Well, is the, we, is the same thing, maybe, well, we could have used here C instead of Psi, and so the parallelism is more evident. Huh? But this is nothing but a generalization of this result, which in R3 is quite trivial. Hmm? Okay, so now we have enough information about projectors to go to the most interesting postulate, which is the third postulate. The third postulate connects all this with physics. Until now, we have only sp spoken of mathematics tools, mathematical tools. Let's go to see what all of this has to do with physics. The third postulate states Tell us what happens when we measure something in a system, in a quantum system. If we measure a time t, <clears throat> an observable, an observable, an observable of a system, that's any property that can be measured of a system, <clears throat> and the system is in the state represented by the vector state psi t, I have put the subindex t because, in general, vector states can evolve with time. So, at a particular time, the probability of obtaining the value ai <coughs> of the discrete spectrum of A is obtained by taking the operator that projects on the eigenstate and on the eigenspace corresponding to this eigenvalue, and then taking the scalar product again with the same state vector. And for a continuous case, for a continuous case, it makes no sense to speak of probabilities of obtaining a value, for instance. But that's a problem not of quantum mechanics, also in classical mechanics. If you measure the speed of a particle in classical mechanics, which is the probability of obtaining, say, the result pi, 3.14, probability zero. If a property can take a continuous set of values, we cannot say which is the probability of obtaining an exact real value. It's impossible to assure that you have obtained an exact real value with infinite coefficient, within uh, decimal figures. And so, in this case, we have to speak of, we have to speak of probability density. Eh? That means the probability of obtaining a value in a small interval around, say, the, for instance, if we are talking about velocity, a given value of the velocity, eh, this is a differential probability divided by the uh, length of this, of this interval. Hmm? So, for positions, for momenta, for linear momentum, linear momentum, velocities, we always speak of probability density. So, for the continuous spectrum of any observable, the probability density, derivative of the probability with respect to the variable we are measuring, again has the same type of expression is given by taking the projection projector onto the subs the eigen space corresponding to this value, applying to the state vector and multiplying on the left hand side by the state vector. 
and the probability of obtaining any value not belonging to the spectrum is zero. Hmm? So we have the receipt for predicting probabilities. Eh? As we have already said, quantum mechanics is uh, uh, indeterministic, and so the postulates allows in general to obtain probabilities for the result of measurements, but in general, except for special cases, not certainties. Hmm? Well, um, in the previous slide, I put the expression of this operator, exactly a parallel expression can be written for the continuous case. Yeah. If, the, if, the, if the value, eigenvalue A is degenerate, then the projection is a sum over the eigenvectors corresponding to that eigenvalue. <clears throat> but, let's uh, continue. <clears throat> um, well, let's. Yeah, any question? Ah, okay. Um, in practice, it's quite convenient if we are going to to calculate probabilities for a given observable to expand the state vector in an orthonormal basis set made of eigenvectors of A. And then the result of those probabilities becomes very simple. Hmm? Let's see why. If I express the state vector in some basis set, in the general case, we could have a discrete part and a continuous part, then <coughs> the probability is just the probability of obtaining a particular eigenvalue A is just, if this is a discrete eigenvalue, is just the sum of the square of these coefficients. Why? Because we have seen that the probability is given by this expression, but here we have seen that this can be written that way, if we use an orthonormal basis set. So, in this case, when we express, when we use as basis set the eigenvectors of A, the probability is directly the sum of the squares of the coefficients corresponding to the eigenvalue we are interested in. And same thing for the continuous case. Probability density is nothing but the sum of the coefficients of all the basis sets that are eigenvectors with this eigenvalue. Okay? <coughs> Exercise. Very simple. Well, I will do it because it's an illust direct illustration of this. Assume that we have a hydrogen atom in this state. A linear combination of the 1s alpha. In this case, we are assuming that spin is relevant. Yeah? And 2p0 beta. And we want to know what probabilities, uh, what are the probabilities of obtaining the possible results for, L, for the total energy, L square, LZ, and SZ. Total energy. First thing, is this state an eigenstate of the total energy operator, of the Hamiltonian operator? We have an expression in terms of eigenstates of the Hamiltonian operator, because in the notation NLM, this quantum number indicates that it's an eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian with eigenvalue 
a n. Hmm? But since these two indexes are different, they correspond to different eigenvalues. So first thing, as we have seen, a linear combination of eigenfunctions with different eigenvalues, not degenerate, then is not an eigenfunction. And if, the, if it is not an eigenfunction, we in general can have several possible results of measuring when we measure that property. In this case, the energy, the probability of obtaining E equal E1 is the sum of all the, the square of the coefficients corresponding to this eigenvalue. This is the only term with eigenvalue e, a, um, e1. So the coefficient squared gives the corresponding probability. Uh, 3 over 4. Okay? And the probability of obtaining the result e2 is the square well, the square of this coefficient, yeah? this is a complex number, so the probability of obtaining E2 when measuring the energy is this coefficient times its conjugate. 1 But to take the conjugate, in fact, is nothing but to oi, okay. oh. to change for <laughs> sorry oh. <laughs> for this <laughs> oh. Oh. Aha, to change the sign of the exponent in the, uh, you know, that, uh, well, uh, in complex numbers, I think you have already reviewed something of complex numbers. To take the conjugate is to change the sign of the part that depends on i. Eh? And so this times this is e to the sum of the coefficient, which is 1, and then would obtain 1 over 4. Of course, it would be unnecessary to do this calculation because here we have only two terms that correspond to energies E1 and E2. So according to the postulate, we can only obtain two results when measuring the energy, E1 and E2, and if the probability for E1 is 3 over 4 and the sum of the probability is much E1, it's clear that the, probably, the probability of obtaining the other one should be 1 over 4. Yeah? Well, same thing for all the other operators. Hmm? I leave you to check the result for the others, but it's to extend the same idea. Okay? For those who have studied in the UB of Barcelona, this should be rather trivial, <laughs> because in the... Yeah, in the subject of the grade, you have all these things. <coughs> well, um, uh, let's, okay. let's have a look to the to a geometrical interpretation of these probabilities. Let's go back to the example of a three-dimensional Hilbert space. I have here any vector of a three-dimensional Hilbert space with three components along the axis corresponding to the eigenstates, the eigenvectors of A. Yeah. Again, I assume, I assume that A has two eigenvalues, one doubly degenerate, so that the horizontal plane is the 
eigen plane with eigenvalue a1 and the other one non-degenerate that corresponds to the vertical axis. Then, the probability of obtaining a1 when measuring a in the state psi, we have seen that in fact is the sum of the squares of the coefficients along two orthogonal axes on the plane. And this is nothing but the square of the length of this projection. And the probability of obtaining A2, since this is non-degenerate, is directly the square of the coefficient that represents the third component, the vertical component of the vector. So probabilities are nothing but the length of the projections over the corresponding eigenspace. And of course, from this geometrical view, it's trivial to see, for instance, that if the eigenvector was originally in the plane, say this one, or the, the state vector was already in the plane, what is the probability of obtaining a one? One. Because this is already in the plane, to project it on the plane makes nothing, and since the state vector are always normalized, the projection is the length of the vector, which is one. Yeah? And same thing for a vector that is initially in the vertical axis. Whenever the state vector is within an eigenspace of the property of the observable we are measuring, the probability of obtaining the corresponding eigenvalue is 1. Probability is 0 for any other. Okay? Well, um, Spectral decomposition of an operator. This is also quite useful. Any operator can be written as a sum of projectors over the different eigenspaces multiplied by the corresponding eigenvalues. And in case we have also continuous part, we should also put an integral of the eigenvalues of the continuous spectrum times the projectors of the continuous spectrum. Hmm? Well, I have here the demonstration for the discrete case. You can have a look. It's rather straightforward. Huh? Um, in particular, if I apply this to the identity operator, we have what we call a resolution of the identity, which in fact is the same that we have written before in explicit basis set. This is the way of putting a resolution of the identity in terms of projectors onto subspaces of any operator. For any operator, we can choose a basis set, a complete set of eigenstates, and then write a resolution of the identity as a sum of all the projectors onto the eigenspaces. Hmm. Um, and how we define a function of an operator? A general way of defining a function of an operator, f of a, is an operator having the same spectral resolution as the original operator, as A, except for that here we have, instead of the eigenvalues of A, we have some functions of these eigenvalues. If this is the, say, the exponential function, for instance, e to a, 
here I should have e to the eigenvalue, which we know how to calculate because these are numbers, not operators. And here we would have e to eigenvalue. Yeah? And so uh, given any function of, of numbers, of real numbers, even complex numbers, we can write the corresponding function for operators. Um, it can be shown from this definition by applying this, making the resolution, the spectral decomposition of all the terms. It can be shown that if the function is analytical, that means that you can take the, any number of derivatives, so you can write a Taylor expansion of the function with numbers, a similar Taylor expansion can be used to define the function of the operator A. Here we have, this is a number, for instance, A to X. This is a number, the derivative of X in some point. And this is the operator. This is a number, and this is the square of the operator. And the, any power of an operator is always defined. It's only to apply N times the operator. So this is an alternative way of defining a function of an operator. Well, the first one is more general because sometimes we have not an analytical expression. And then we cannot use this expansion, but this is always uh, valid yeah, as a definition. Hmm? Let's see some examples. <clears throat> uh, okay. Oops, no. Well, when no relativistic effects are included in the Hamiltonian of a polyelectronic atom, that is, we only consider kinetic energy and Coulomb potential energy, the corresponding energy levels are what we call spectral terms. In fact, spectral terms are energy levels for the case that we neglect spin orbit, interac spin orbit interactions and other relativistic terms in the Hamiltonian. The useful notation for this includes the electron configuration and the eigenvalues of L squared and S squared for the states of the term. For instance, you probably know, you have those who have studied the basic course of quantum chemistry, know that the ground state of the carbon atom has the configuration 1s2, 2s2, 2p2, and uh, there are three terms corresponding to this configuration, and the ground state has, is is called the triplet P. Hmm? Well, of course, we can do this because it can be shown that L square, S square, and also the Z components are uh, compatible with the Hamiltonian, and all of them are compatible within them, themselves. So the, the five operators represent five compatible observables. Hmm? Well, my question is, which of these operators are functions of the Hamiltonian? And uh, then to specify, a C, well, three complete set of observables for a polyelectronic atom. Think about it, and we will discuss it on Tuesday. Okay. <clears throat> but, uh, I. Uh, well, I just also to recall properties of angular momenta that you have probably already seen when we have the addition of several, of two or more angular momenta, 
Yeah, for instance, let's consider uh, an, it could be an orbital and the spin angular momentum of a particle, but it could also be two orbital angular momenta of different particles or two types of angular momenta of a molecule, for instance, rotational and electronic, any type of angular momenta, then the, if we represent with J the sum, then the quantum numbers corresponding to J square can be related to the quantum numbers corresponding to L and S by the well-known series. J can take values from the sum to the difference in absolute value descending one by one. Yeah? Well, this is not very, not a very rigorous statement, but this is a practical rule that allows, for instance, to obtain the spectral terms or to obtain the values of the total angular momentum of an atom, for instance, in the previous case, in quantum chemistry courses, you probably have seen that for this term we have L equal 1, that means letter P means that the quantum number L, this is a quantum number associated to L square, yeah, to the operator L square, which is the total orbital angular momentum of the, of the whole set of electrons, of the six electrons of the atom. Yeah. The number three means that S equal one, yeah, which is a number, quantum number associated to S square, yeah, and uh, this is multiplicity yeah, to S plus one. And then, if we want to include a spin orbit effects, then we have to calculate possible values for G, which is the sum of L plus S. Mm -hmm. And the quantum number corresponding to G square can take the values from L plus S to L minus S, so 2, 1, 0. And this allows, the consequence of this is that in fact when you include spin-orbit interactions, the term triplet P, which includes nine states, because uh, the quantum numbers ML can take the value 1, 0, minus 1, and the same for MS. And then these nine states when you consider spin orbit interaction, are split into three levels which correspond to the three values of J, yeah, which are well, this is an example of using the rule that you probably all of you know, but I recall it just in case. Okay? I think it's uh, time, so we leave it here and hope you can have a look to the exercises for Tuesday. Thank you very much. Vamos a ver si consigo poner esto. Ah, ya. Ok, wait a moment, guardar cambios, no. Um, there are, okay, <laughs> if you have questions and you still are there, we can, we can comment on them. Eh? Maybe it's too late <laughs> if you are already <laughs> leaving. Okay, we leave them for the next day. <laughs>